Hello everyone. In this video, I will talk about five diseases in brief, as brief as they can be, and I'll try, take, try to make up stories and try to make up links between those diseases and also in, inside the disease. Okay, the first one we have here is neurofibromatosis type 2. And you see in the name that neurofibromatosis. So you will have some fibromas or some tumors which arises from the nerve tissues. And commonly you have uh, tumors arising from the peripheral nerve sheets and as you remember peripheral nerve sheets are composed of swan cells so they form the peripheral nerve malin sheet and you get commonly you get swan cell tumors in, in, in cranial nerves in case of spinal nerves you can get uh, swan cell tumor so they are called swanoma and are the most classic feature in neurofibromatosis type 2 is something called a bilateral so in two sides acoustic meaning that the swanoma occurs in close to the internal acoustic meters which is actually the gateway for your vestibular cochlear nerve to enter from the cranium to the internal ear inner ear okay so this is a gateway for the vestibular cochlear nerve and in this region of gateway there is formation of swanoma which involves the vestibular cochlear nerve or eighth cranial nerve and that's why it's called bilateral acoustic swanomas and this is the most classic feature of neurofibromatosis type 2 but also you can get neurofibromatosis or neurofibroma in peripheral nerves okay and you can get something called meningioma which is a, simply a tumor of the arachnoid uh, arachnoid matter which is actually the middle layer of your um, meninges so you can have meningiomas too and commonly there is associated cataracts uh, in those patients okay so this is about this is the basic idea about neurofibromatosis type 2 uh, next let's go to sarcoidosis okay so sarcoidosis is a disease that commonly occurs in specific group of people number one african-americans especially female so female african-american it's kind of an autoimmune disease but uh, the specific details of why it occurs nobody knows there are some proposed theories but nobody knows but what occurs we know that what happens and what happens is called a non caseating granuloma formation and the non caseating granuloma can form in a lot of areas of the body but most typically they involve the lung tissues and also the lymph nodes so the most commonly you see you see a, a reticular nodular opacity in the lung which actually causes some dyspnea some dry cough and also it involves uh, it involves the lymph nodes in two sides of the uh, two sides of the chest which are called hilar lymph nodes so there is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and if you biopsy those lymph nodes you will get you will get a non caseating granuloma so um, and this is very classic because in case of TB you will get something called a caseating granuloma and those patients commonly also have uveitis along with along with this bilateral hilar adenopathy some other features which are also associated with sarcoidosis are number one hypercalcemia and the reason why hypercalcemia occurs in sarcoidosis goes like this in case of sarcoidosis you have granuloma and in granuloma the most important cell that are composed uh, that, that are inside the granuloma are activated macrophages which form epithelial cells and sometimes they form giant cells and those activated macrophages have some alpha 1, one alpha hydroxylase activity which can activate the 25 hydroxylated vitamin d forming a calcitriol so there will be excess formation of 125 dihydroxycholicalciferol or calcitriol from those macrophages leading to a high level of high level of vitamin d in the serum leading to a state of hypercalcemia and those patients can sometimes also get uh, some nodes are called erythema nodosum but that, that i think that's low yield and one of the uh, next high yield uh, point here is they, that they, those patients have an elevated level of acetylcholine esterase and jam so the asea is elevated and uh, you, can, you, can, you can actually tie in with the concept i don't know why it occurs but i can tie in uh, with a specific idea that sarcoidosis commonly involves lung and in lungs you have endothelium which secretes ACE so ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme is produced in the endothelium of lung so it makes sense that whenever you have a chronic inflammation going on in the lung maybe I don't know maybe there is some release of cytokines which causes stimulation of the endothelium and release of ACE so ACE level gets up 
in your blood okay that's that's kind of my idea of remembering it for the purpose of remembering okay then then one classic presentation of a mucor or rhizopus fungal infection is HCR on phase of patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is a very classic presentation. So mucor or rhizopus are funguses and those funguses causes opportunistic infection in severely immunosuppressed patient or patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. And they commonly involve the nasal mucosa, the paranasal sinuses, and they can cause inflammation or infection of the eye and and when they cause infection they tend to invade the local structure and this leads to necrosis of local structure forming a black estuary on the face of the patient uh, so this is a very classic presentation okay uh, next we have uh, osteogenesis imperfecta so osteogenesis imperfecta so imperfect formation of bone so bones have two main components you have calcium and you have collagen this is the basic this is my idea so you have calcium or collagen either defect will lead to a fragile bone so in case of osteogenesis imperfecta you have a defect of type 1 collagen and type 1 collagen is present on bone right b o n e bone so in case of bone you have one so type 1 collagen is present in bone and if you have a defect in type 1 collagen the bone tissues will be weaker fragile and that's why those patients will have recurrent fractures uh, after minimal trauma like a fall or at or some traumas minimal trauma will lead to fractures and commonly it con is confused with child abuse and one of the classic feature of this this uh, osteogenesis imperfecta is blue sclera normally the sclera is not blue it's kind of white uh, because it has sclera which contains a lot of collagen and if the collagens in the sclera are decreased in amount now the the choroid underneath the sclera will light up as blue because the choroid has veins, a lot of veins. So the venous blood looks blue and the choroid will look blue and it will shine through the small thin sclera. So the sclera will look like blue though as it uh, though it is not blue, it is actually the blue choroid visible through the transparent sclera because it's transparent, transparent, it's transparent because there is low amount of collagen. Okay, that's the basic idea in case of osteogenesis imperfecta. And the last condition we are going to talk about is lead poisoning. So whenever someone has lead poisoning, lead deposits in a lot of tissues in your body. It deposits in your joints, in your kidney, in your brain, in your uh, bones. And in any case of if it deposits on the gingiva, it causes something called a burden line. And this is a bluish line on gingiva. And as you can remember, lead poisoning commonly presents with symptoms of multiple situ multiple uh, systems. As it causes neurotoxicity, it commonly presents with headache, concentration and memory problem. It can cause abdominal pain, lead lines on long bones, and it also reduces the formation of hemoglobin because it inhibits ferrocalitis and it inhibits uh, delta amylolevulonic acid dehydrogenase so those two enzymes are inhibited by lead which leads to uh, macrocytic hypochromic anemia and also it, it sometimes leads to basophilic stippling so that's all for those five diseases the most important points i think